And so today we have uh, Sarah Ostrich, and she's going to talk to you about the intersection between art and science. And she's going to use illustration and storytelling to talk about light and matter. So with that, I'll hand it over to her. Art and storytelling. So this is a little bit about my pathway into science and kind of what I do now as a grad student. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking to you a little bit about, about my pathway to science and uh, my interests. And then I'll go into about basically the adva advancements in science and art that led to the horse in motion, which is a great story that kind of describes the foundations of spectroscopy, which is the research that I do that I'll talk about a little bit more about. And lastly, I will end with uh, talking about scientific communication through art. So this uh, will do will involve a bit, a bit about of what we're doing in our breakout room, and I will also talk about what I do now and what I've been interested in. Okay. So my path to science basically started in San Diego, California, where I was born. And I, uh, as you can see here, there's not a lot of science, but I was always really interested in art. So uh, I, in my free time, I always painted and took art classes, um, but I was always very exposed to science because both my parents were actually chemists. So I had recognized from an early age that I had an interest in both and tried to pursue both as, um, through high school. And then I ended up at uh, the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, so a little bit north of San Diego, where I decided to study chemistry. Uh, I was really uh, interested in, I was mostly interested in science and uh, because of, you know, honestly seeing my parents and, but also um, just wanting to figure out more about the world. And I got into research in my sophomore year at college in the Delati Research Group. And this man here was my advisor, Jahan Delati. And he would basically talk about the way that he described his science was so intriguing to me and so compelling. And he was always such a great storyteller that uh, he really inspired me to want to teach science in the way that he does. And he was actually the first person to tell me the horse in motion story that I will be telling you a little bit later in this talk. So at, uh, at this time at USC, I did research which basically involved light probing chemical reactions. So that it was basically my initial uh, footing into research and I really liked that. And now that I uh, am here at Yale, so I decided to pursue a graduate degree in chemistry, uh, my PhD. And I'm currently in my fourth or going into my fifth year of my studies. And I wanted to continue using light to probe chemical reactions, but instead of um, using or instead of doing it in vials and basically organic synthetic chemistry, I wanted to do it using lasers. And so this is what you see me doing here in this picture. And then the, here is my uh, group now at Yale, the Energy Sciences Institute. So basically, once again, what I'm doing is using light to probe, uh, to probe chemical reactions, but really all around us, we're constantly seeing that. Everything that we see in the world isn't actually the object, but really it's light reflecting off of, that, um, off of those objects and into our eyes. And that is how we perceive the entire world, world around us. And so this is how I look at my cat, Coconut. Here she is. Uh, it's really not just me seeing her. I'm seeing the light all around me bounce off of her and into my eyes. Okay, so I wanted to show you a picture of an electromagnetic spectrum because I really want to uh, talk about or emphasize how light can be used as a probe for different types of processes, right? So I want to ask you all, so this is a opportunity to write in the chat, what, what do we use these different frequencies for? So just go ahead and say, if you know uh, what radio waves are used for, you can go ahead and write that in the chat. If you know what microwaves are used for, go ahead and write that. Uh, infrared waves, visible light, ultraviolet waves, x-rays, gamma rays. So these are all different types of frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum. And they all have different purposes. So let's see. 
Radio microwaves are used for communication. Yes, yeah, so radio waves, right? So this is uh, whenever we turn the radio on in our car, whenever we make phone calls, exactly, cell phones, right? What else do we do with microwaves? Do people have those at home? Yep, we cook food. So the microwaves actually directly excite the vibrational modes of water, causing them to evaporate in order to heat up your food. And so we're, again, we're directly probing using microwaves, a uh, chemical bond, which is water in our food. Yeah, so microwave for heating, yep. Ultraviolet might have to do with filters, yes. So uh, we do have lots of filters in all forms of, you know, any type of light spectroscopy. Um, but ultraviolet, causes things to glow in the dark, right? We've seen that before. X-rays are used for bodies. Uh, yes, in order to see bones. Yep, or chemical reactions. Great, these are all so great. Thank you so much. Yeah, so here's some, you guys gave some of these examples here, uh, but what some of these stronger wavelengths can do, I will just point out, is uh, excite core electrons. So these are basically uh, very, very energetic, tightly bound, uh, electrons in the atoms of your body that can be um, erupted with strong energy. So that's why, you know, certain energies are da more dangerous than others versus if we, you know, for visible light, for instance, it's just how, it's what allows us to see with UV, uh, it gives us sunburns. So all different types of processes. Thank you guys for participating in the chat. Okay. So what I study is something called terahertz spectroscopy. So this lies in the terahertz gap of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so whenever I say terahertz gap, what does that mean? So basically there was this gap in the electromagnetic spectrum. And I believe that Matt Capobianco, who is another one of the volunteers here, has given a talk on terahertz spectroscopy in the past. And if you're interested in this, you can go back and look at that. Uh, or maybe you might recall, recall some of this information. But basically there's this region in the spectrum called the terahertz gap. And it's where we are not able to generate light, either electronically or through heat. So uh, basically, we have to use special methods of use, utilizing lasers in order to develop and generate and detect this light. So that's kind of what my advisor did during his PhD. And now I'm using this tool in order to study materials for solar energy purposes. But uh, one relevant example of terahertz is airport body security scanners. So if you've ever been to the airport and been through one of these giant security scanners, that's actually terahertz. So again, that lies in the uh, far infrared region of the spectrum. So this is invisible light, we cannot see it. And it is lower in energy than a microwave and is, it is not harmful. Um, but that is one relevant example of where it is used. Again, I use it to study electron mobility in solar materials. Okay, so a little bit different. So this, may, uh, with that, I want to introduce this story, the horse in motion. So this is basically, hopefully this story will give you a better idea of what spectroscopy is. And once again, how I use light and how si some scientists use light to study uh, charge mobility in materials. Okay, and so that's kind of one aspect of me telling the story. The, another aspect is basically seeing that these develop, developments in uh, photography have led to developments in science. So I want to emphasize that as well. Okay, so to get started, basically this man, Edward Moybridge, wanted to know how horses galloped. We all did. Back in the day, no one knew how this happened. It happens too quickly for us to be able to resolve it with our eyes. So basically, if you look at a horse running, it is impossible to tell how their legs are moving. So if you look at these old paintings of horses galloping, they're galloping in all sorts of ways and they're all wrong, they're all incorrect. And it wasn't until flash photography that we were actually able to resolve how horses' legs move while they gallop. And so what the scientists did here is they set up an experiment where all of these cameras are lined up back here and they are going to be triggered by these trip wires here. So the, the horse will run across these wires and trigger the cameras such that 
you're able to take frame by frame shots of the horse running milliseconds apart. So once again, to describe what's happening here is whenever you take a flash photo, light comes out of the flash of the camera, hits the horse and reflects back to the detector, which is the camera in a quick enough amount of time that you're able to resolve what the horse is doing. So basically that's the shutter speed of the camera. That's on the order of milliseconds. Okay, what do the images look like? So this is what the experiment came out as. So we can see these frame by frame shots of the horse running over these trip wires and triggering the cameras. And so we can see here as well, the horse with all its legs off the ground. So this is how a horse gallops. We can see it go by frame by frame. Here they go. And there's that moment right there with all its legs off the ground. So just for fun, let's compare what did the horses uh, look like when they were painted versus what do they actually look like? Well, their legs aren't quite fully splayed out as they're exhibited in these paintings. Uh, and whenever they're fully off the ground, their legs are together, actually. So yeah, this is useful information that we had no idea about before the advent of this technology, right? And so if we could, uh, and, and it also changed art, it changed, uh, you know, it basically had ripple effects in both directions. And what I want to say here is, uh, or what I want to show you actually next is some images by the New York Times at the from the Sochi Olympics. So this is our frame by frame images of athletes uh, doing tricks. So basically, this is relevant, we're going to be watching the Olympics, maybe later this year. And uh, Often what happens whenever I'm watching is I have no idea what they're doing. It's happening so quickly, I can't actually tell. So it's so wonderful to see, I mean, such striking and interesting images that give you, that provide you with information on what is happening. Here's another image of a solemn skier. Okay, so if we can study fast things using short light pulses, then we can study even faster things using even shorter light pulses, okay? So that's the idea. And that's basically the scientific progress that came from this. And this is the foundation of all spectroscopy is the idea that we can use short light pulses to study short processes just in the way that we used a flash pulse from a photograph to study what a horse is doing. Okay, so basically whenever I say ultra fast, what does that mean? Well, I'm talking about using pico, so picosecond pulses. So that's 10 to the negative 12 seconds. So that's very, very short. That's very fast. But what does that actually mean? So to give you an analogy, basically in 30 picoseconds, light travels nearly one centimeter. So 30 picoseconds, light will travel as far as across the top of your thumb or your fingernail. Uh, in one second, light travels nearly 300,000 kilometers, which is three quarters of the way to the moon. And so that's just basically how quickly our light pulses are from our lasers. Uh, and that just is to give you an idea of how short they are and how quickly we're able to resolve things. So this is kind of an image of what I, we, what we study, which is solar materials. So visible light will photo excite a material. Electrons will be promoted to an excited state that is very short lived. It's on the order of picoseconds. Again, so short. Uh, and so that is what, and the, the fact, the way that we're able to resolve it is using these super fast pulses. Okay. So yeah, here's basically one image. Um, one, so one final thought before we go into our breakout rooms. So this is scanning electron microscopy. So this is a, another technique that I use, which basically um, in order or in research. And I just wanted to bring this up um, and introduce it to you to basically show some of these images. Um, so it's similar to a microscope, but rather than using a visible light to probe the particles, an electron beam is used. And so, yes, instead of using light, to probe chemicals or reactions, in this case, electrons are being used. And that's basically in order to get a smaller resolution. So if, if any of you went to my SEM talk um, a couple weeks back, you might've heard about this then. Um, 
But basically, uh, what I wanted to show you here was that I uh, ended up using these SEM images, which were part of my research, for uh, to build a collage and eventually do some art projects, which I will talk about after the break. So thank you so much for sticking with me so far. We're going to be talking about, uh, so go, for our breakout rooms, we're going to be looking at Color Me PhD, some of these coloring pages. So this is actually a free scientific art coloring book that you can find on colormephd.org by Julie Rohrer. And essentially what it is, is it has different PhD theses that have been illustrated uh, by either Julie or other uh, of her colleagues. And they basically are illustrations that show the scientific processes that are happening that are accompanied with short blurbs that describe them. Um, so, Yes, I guess we will be going into breakout rooms and choosing one of these to go over and looking through it. All right, welcome back everyone. I hope that you enjoyed uh, the going through the coloring pages. Just remember that those are free uh, to download at your leisure and there's more to check out if any of them interested you. And uh, I think the first coloring book focuses more on energy and renewables, while the second one is more bio-focused, if that's what interests you. Okay, so back to, let me share these slides. Okay, so tying everything together. So at this point, I've been doing, again, research for seven years, combining college and so uh, this part of my PhD. And just been illustrating and I've always had a passion for it and didn't really know where it fit in but again I told you my advisor at USC was really good at storytelling and had uh what would use great analogies in order to communicate science and it was wonderful in order to basically it felt like in a few words I was he was able to communicate what I needed to know generally and so what fascinates me about images is that you can do a similar thing except with no words, oftentimes. You can just illustrate a process and ideally communicate an idea to people without any words. And I think that is very fascinating to me and I think can simplify science uh, in a very effective way. And uh, while still maintaining integrity, if done well. And that is what my goal is. So here is an example of some of my scientific art. And this is uh, with my coworkers. It was about a paper that we wrote basically about using terahertz spectroscopy to, pro um, to probe emerging materials for solar energy purposes. So some of these materials are these things called perovskites, metal organic frameworks, nanoparticles, 2D materials. There's lots of talks that have been on some of these materials, but Basically, we are these scientists using our tools, which are the terahertz spectroscopy, in order to study these materials. So I used this SEM collage of all these different materials that we study, and I overlaid it with some illustrations of, or more simplistic illustrations of what those materials look like. And another image here. So basically here on the left, so this is for a organic chemistry journal. Uh, my friend is an organic chemist and he wrote this paper on total synthesis of natural products. So organic chemistry is way different than a lot of what I've been talking about today. What I've been talking about today is a lot of physical or physics chemistry, uh, physical chemistry. So, but basically what he does as an organic chemist is create these massive molecules uh, that are derived from plants. And he generates the, and they they basically work as if they are, uh, it's very strategic. And so they're working as if they're playing this chess game. And so that's what this image is, is conveying here. And over here on the right, this is a safety poster that basically is like, don't keep your lab mates in the dark, label, label your chemistry, uh, you, just in case there are any reactive or dangerous things happening, we wanna know how to take care of it. So again, these are just fun ways to communicate different forms of science. This is uh, one, one more, everyone should see themselves in science. So this is for basically a diversity and inclusion cover art series. Uh, but 
what I, what I did here is basically took these d orbitals. So what are basically all you need to know about d orbitals is that they mathematically describe the location and probability or like a, a behavior of an electron. So it's just a model of where the electrons are, okay? And that's a, this is a mathematical image. And it's interesting because this, this is an example of communicating math uh, in, through art so we can visualize what we're describing when we're talking about where electrons are. Regardless, I basically took that idea and used it for this art piece here uh, to emphasize this purpose. Um, but basically this image here of these d orbitals made, makes me think of atomic models and how these have evolved over time. So uh, yes, I drew the picture on the right. But uh, yeah, so basically back, their models have evolved over time. There are ways that we visualize science that we later determine are not good ways to visualize science, right? And so many people have seen these models of the atom previously. And now it is, we do not use these because we recognize that they're not entirely accurate. And rather a quantum model, so again, looking back at these d orbitals is a better way of describing where electrons are in an atom. So that's a really cool image of, or illustration again of how Art and science have kind of met in this middle communication center. Uh, well, okay, last one of my art is basically I wrote or I drew this uh, banner image here for my friend's psychology paper. And I, it basically was looking at uh, partisan movement surrounding COVID. And I included these images of COVID molecules. And I think this is another interesting story of how, you know, we see these images all the time now, but how did these, this actually come to Actually by Alyssa Eckert and Dan Higgins of the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. And they came up with this based off of this microscope image that was released by the NIH of COVID. And so we can see that it has, it's these circular structures with these uh, nodes with these stringy nodes off the end. And so that is what they generated. But they even thought so much even about the color. So uh, Alyssa said, I didn't want it to be too playful. For instance, I tried greens and blues, but it just didn't speak to me at all. And it kind of felt flat. The red and orange combination, combination is just very striking. It calls your attention and it makes you look at it. So it's interesting to think about now, after seeing this image exposed to us, you know, constantly over the last year, how it actually came to be. And there were people behind it. No, viruses do not have colors. Great question in the chat. This is just an illustration. So that, that was a choice to put those colors in to, in order to communicate really a feeling of how we want to associate with these molecules. Yeah, we would not be able to see. Um, yeah, they don't have colors, they're, not, they're too small they're not going to be interacted with light in the same ways that we interact with light or macromolecules interact with light. And that's why I'm able to, as a chemist, to probe really small reactions using different forms of light. Okay, so that's kind of it about my art. I wanted to bring up one last thing and I wanted to talk about TikTok. And the reason why is because we cannot ignore it. This is a extremely uh, prevalent form of media today. And I am very interested in the scientists on TikTok and what they're doing and how they're getting young people excited about science and communicating science. And so I wanted to show you a couple of videos to look at the different ways that scientists are communicating their science. Communicating their science. Are you terrified of the dark? Boy, am I ever. Eek! Well, be afraid no more with chemiluminescence. Okay, so that's actually my friend Nick at 
Columbia. He's a postdoc and he's basically making videos uh, using humor uh, to basically describe uh, science. And so that was basically just a cool video of showing a chemical reaction that exhibits luminescence. Weird, but cool. Yes, that's generally the vibe of his videos. Okay, let's, let's look at another one. What do we see here? This is Hank Green. So he's much more of a storyteller in the way he communicates science. I've gotten to the place where I understand this intuitively, but I don't have a good way of communicating what's going on. I think terms like angular momentum don't really help. The reality that if you use a fidget spinner, you, spin a fidget, you can actually feel this as you turn it. You can feel that there's some push, that you actually have to push it more than you have to push it if it wasn't spinning helps as well. But I do know that this is an extremely useful effect because if you have a satellite in space and you want to move it around and point it in a different direction or something to look at a different star, if it's a telescope, you would think that the only way to do that would be to like shoot little jets of air out to twist it and spin it around. But no, you can use this effect to have an internal little spinny thing and then you move that spinny thing and it moves the whole satellite. That's so cool. I've gotten to okay that basically is a video to explaining how gyroscopes work and that might require a few more watches because gyroscopes are extremely confusing but I, again a very interesting way and in, in fun way to learn about these complicated processes okay one the last one i'll show you today this one is by Nile Red. And that is just a beautiful video of colorful chemistry. And I guess I wanted to end with that just to say that that is one that is one reason why I became a chemist was because of the colors and they always say that uh, or that is a very popular reason why people join. Okay, my last slide is just to say thank you to all of you for listening to my talk. Thank you to all of my lab mates for helping me do this research. Uh, this is a caricature illustration I've done of all my lab mates and my our professors and then here we are at a Hartford Yard Goats game a couple weeks ago. Thank you so much and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay I can ask questions. Um, thank you for that Sarah that was fantastic. Um, really interesting and I love the storytelling in science and I think pretty much all the volunteers here think that science communication is really important so um, that's fantastic. Um, we had one question about the SEM, um, and we were, they were wondering how, um, I guess, scanning electron microscope handles the electrons. So I guess kind of maybe in two parts, like, or maybe three parts, like one, how do you generate them? How do you control it? And like, is there like safety issues maybe? Yeah, that's a great question. So basically, uh, SEMs are basically utilize electron beams to look at materials closely. So rather than microscopes using light beams and a series of lenses to do that. And the reason why we use electrons is because they have a much smaller wavelength than light. And so basically that's what allows us to see objects closely. Uh, again, you can check out the SEM talk, but basically to answer your question of, uh, how are they generated? They're generated through an electron beam, which is an extremely high energy, high voltage process, and it requires a lot of cooling. And so basically it's done in a vacuum uh, and cooled by liquid nitrogen, which is at 77 degrees Kelvin, which is basically extremely cold, just uh, negative 100 something degrees. And so basically we need to, um, we generate it through basically very high energy processes and it is extremely dangerous if not contained um, and cooled. 
So we have to make sure to uh, do those safety procedures. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, another question we have is, can chemiluminescence illuminate like other objects? Yeah, definitely. So basically we are, so chemiluminescence uh, happens because a chemical reaction exhibits fluorescence. And so uh, I guess another object couldn't necessarily exhibit chemiluminescence. Or so what, what I'm imagining could happen to answer your question is if the fluorescence that was emitted could photo excite another material that could then fluoresce. That could happen. Um, but I think it would have to be a very special scenario. <laughs> Got it. Okay, I'm putting a link right now in the chat that in this video um, has Sarah showing the SEM um, that we have in our lab. So if you wanna like learn a little bit more about it or see it, um, check out that video. And then we have time for just, I think one last question. Um, and Kenzie would like you to talk a little bit more about what a D orbital is. Um, yeah, could you like talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. So a D orbital, basically uh, that was just, the, I was, so I was, I guess I explained the D orbital because I was using it in the image of the art, but really all these orbitals of atoms, uh, there's different kinds. There's also S orbitals, F orbitals. Basically these are just mathematical representations of uh, where electrons that are, where the, they are most probably in a atom. And so basically this is just um, a new model, uh, basically a model of how we understand what atoms look like and how they behave. So basically d orbitals have to do with electrons, uh, probably more, a little complicated. So don't worry about it too much, but definitely I appreciate your curiosity. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, actually, I think, okay, maybe one more real quick. Yeah. Um, does chemiluminescence wear out? Like would that reaction end? Yes, definitely. So there's all sorts of time scales that these reactions can happen on. So whenever we saw that chemiluminescence that was in the TikTok, that was happening on the order of seconds. I mean, the video was going on for seconds of time and it was still fluorescing. Uh, there are also materials that only fluoresce for picoseconds. And remember how short picoseconds were? And so those are the materials that I'm often looking at that are only reactive in those excited states for only 20 picoseconds or something. So yes, uh, that chemiluminescence lasted a very long time in terms of, you know, relative to how short some processes can be. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, yeah, well, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, this is fantastic. Um, if anyone else has more questions, you can drop them in the chat and Sarah can type back.